Well, thank you for being here. Uh, uh, and I didn't change that, but that's okay. Um, so I'm Matt Sherburn. I'm in the material science and engineering department. And uh, I would be, if you come here to Berkeley for your master's of engineering, I would be your academic advisor and um, help answer any questions related to the technical aspects of the program. Also on the call is Ariana, who she answers all of the university questions you might have um, and is a spectacular resource for you um, to help you navigate the bureaucracy that is Berkeley. Um, and so Ariana is full time in the department and her specialty is graduate student affairs. So PhD students and masters of engineering students, um, she is there to help you um, sort everything out and answer any questions you have along with me. Um, and so typically she has uh, about half the week remote and about half the week uh, in person uh, here on campus. Uh, so Berkeley, here's a fairly old picture, right? Chartered in 1868. Um, it really, we as material science department come out of the College of Engine or college, what was the College of Mining. Um, there actually is an old mine shaft at the back of the building. Um, and we went from mining to mining and metallurgy to mining and mineral engineering, right? Eventually to materials and mineral engineering, uh, and then eventually to material science and engineering. And so Phoebe Apperson Hurst uh, was a big benefactor to the college uh, and to particularly our department. Um, and so uh, really helped set the tone for what Berkeley became. Uh, so just these are the two original buildings on campus. The one on the left is actually still here, South Hall. These were the colleges of mechanics and civil engineering that eventually became part of the College of Engineering. Um, the Hearst Memorial Mining Building originally was built for $900,000. Um, so fairly cheap by today's standard. John Galen Howard was the university architect and you will see lots of buildings on campus that uh, are credited to uh, John Galen Howard. Uh, so Hearst Memorial Mining Building has gone through um, renovations fairly recently. Uh, this is a 1909 beautiful hillside and actually just back here off the right back corner of the building uh, is actually where the mine shaft uh, is. Um, oh, sorry, 1920, 1940 and today. Uh, and so it went through a $92 million renovation about two decades ago now. Um, and so the building floats on base isolation units uh, to keep it safe from an earthquake. <clears throat> the lobby that I walk through every day uh, is on the left. It was inspired by the National Library in Paris. So it's a gorgeous building. Just off the lobby is the student bay. And so um, the low picture on the lower right are, is the doors out into the lobby area that you just saw. Um, the picture on the upper left is the student bay um, with, there are lots of tables uh, in the back by the chalkboard. And so um, lots of the students meet in this area to work on projects, work on homework assignments, just to meet up. Uh, and so the grad students, the postdocs, 
and you, the master students, are all in this space together. So you get to know all of our current grad students uh, from being around them. All right. So we make an effort to immerse you into the department. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Um, just some quick facts about Berkeley, right? Um, we have 14 colleges and schools. We're located in the College of Engineering, 170 departments and interdisciplinary research units. Uh, all of the programs, or at least almost all the programs, are fairly high, highly ranked, with 48 being in the top 10 um, for our doctoral programs. Eight current Nobel laureates, 22 past and current faculty Nobel Prize winners. Um, multiple other prizes, um, a, a little over a billion dollars a year in research funding. Um, total campus population is about 45,000 students. Um, in the College of Engineering, right, the departments are all fairly highly ranked, regardless of the uh, whether it's QS rankings or US News or what have you. So um, we're all fairly well thought of. One of the things that I like to stress is while there are 45,000 students on campus between graduate and undergraduate, we as a department are pretty small. And so you get all of the advantages of being on a large campus, along with the advantages of being in a small department, right? So I get to know the students by name. I get to talk to them all the time. Um, and so I think it's the best of both worlds. Um, we have about 145 undergrads and about 170, uh, 72, I know it says here, but roughly 170 graduates. The MEng program, we keep somewhere around 20 to 30 a year. We're not looking to have, you know, 70 MEng students, 50 MEng students. We like the program to be small. That way it keeps it manageable for myself um, and certainly Ariana. But this way, if you have questions, you can come talk to me. Um, right now, we have a number of students that are applying for OPT, um, and so this is meaningful to our international applicants, and they come talk to me, and I ultimately am the one to sign off on these things, and I sign off on them um, every year, but if I had 50 students, then it becomes tough to treat everybody as an individual, right, and so... Um, it keeps it more personal. The students have issues. They can come talk to me, right? Um, and so we, we're we not looking to have some huge Masters of Engineering program. We keep it fairly small. Um, we have a fairly diverse student population. Um, our faculty are fairly accomplished, right? Um, also in my role as uh, in the material science department, I also serve as director for international partnerships for the College of Engineering. So I was just in Taiwan and Singapore last week for spring break. Um, so as a department, we average about a million dollars a year per faculty for research expenditure. Um, again, it's a small school feel in a big school environment. Um, the picture here on the bottom is actually of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And so that's on the hill right behind campus. And so you're actually looking at the advanced light sources, the dome. And so people from all over the world come and use that to characterize their materials. And the building on the right is building two, which houses the electronic materials program. 
And so there are lots of resources on campus, depending on what you're, and at the National Lab, depending on what your interests are. Um, we have um, the NanoFab facility, uh, which you can take if you're interested in the semiconductor industry, you can take courses that actually will allow you to get into the fab and learn how to use the equipment. We have QB3, but we're also starting up a materials characterization facility that will service the campus that is gonna be housed here in the Hearst Mining Building. Um, so on the top right, the picture of the two people sitting there, one in the blue shirt is Professor Miner, who's director for the National Center of Electron Microscopy and a professor in the Material Science Department. And then the one seated in the chair is Professor Hoseman, who uh, is a materials person, focuses on nuclear uh, materials. And he, he's the director for our new Center for Manufacturing or Manufacturing 360. And I'm uh, his co-director for that center. And then of course, behind the campus, we have the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where about 80% of our faculty all have appointments. Uh, and this gains us access to all of the resources there. Um, and so in way of curriculum, right, you have likely seen this. Um, there is a, the, the program's really kind of two programs in one. There is this technical aspect to the program, which myself and Ariana are in charge of helping you manage. And then there's the business side of the program, the communication side, the management side, which is run out of the Fung Institute. So, for the technical side, you need 12 units of nominally MSE courses. Okay. Um, we just had a faculty vote, I don't know, a month ago, maybe two months ago now, where now we have eased this requirement. Because if you look, you may be interested in maybe the mecha mechanical aspects of materials. And there might be classes in mechanical engineering that ultimately suit your goal. Um, or there might be a class in electrical engineering or bioengineering that suits your ultimate goal. So what we did, we have said of the four classes, that are nominally required for you to reach your 12 units of MSE, you can replace one of these courses with another 200 level class from COE, any COE department, right? And so this gives you more flexibility to design a program that specifically suits your ultimate goals. And I will work with you on designing the program, helping you select courses. Um, we'll give you as much help as you need to as little help as you need, right? Um, the one caveat to this is if you have to take MSC 200A, um, you cannot replace 200A. You would replace one of the other courses. And I'll talk more about 200A in a moment. Um, the most up-to-date version of our, what courses are going to be offered is at classes.berkeley.edu. Um, right now, the courses that are offered in the, and I, oh, I didn't update this either. These cl classes are what are listed. I know it says fall 2021, sorry. Um, that's my fault for not updating this. I was should have been updating this last night, but I went through classes.berkeley.edu and we have a host of classes for the fall. 
The ones for spring 2024 have not been posted, but these are typical of the classes that are offered. Um, in the spring, we have a significant number of um, characterization classes offered. Also, I know that Professor Yao is going to be offering his optical um, properties class, his graduate course, I think it's 218. Um, I know this because I'm gonna teach an undergraduate course to free him up to teach his graduate course. I just don't remember whether that's fall or spring. So there are likely more classes to be offered than you see here. Um, but classes.berkeley.edu is a good place to start. Okay, so MSC 200A, we list as a requirement. If you have a undergraduate degree in material science, you can opt out of 200A, thus freeing you up to take other classes. 200A, because we get so many grad students who are not material science or do not have a material science background, MSE 200A is an introduction to material science. And it really stresses this idea of structure, our ability to control the structure of a material and how that relates to properties or the structure properties relationship. This is important um, because you're getting a degree in material science. And when you go interview, people are going to expect you to understand a property structure relationship. Right. And so when we talk to people that hire our grad students or undergrads, um, one of the things they expect is that our students understand the structure properties relationship. And so this is Apple, this is Chevron, right? All of the companies in Silicon Valley that hire our grad students. And so um, we require this course if you do not have a foundation in material science represented by an undergraduate degree in material science or polymer engineering or a very, very closely related field to material science. Now, if you have that degree, right? I don't expect you to remember this. We have a Google form. I'll send this out. You fill it out. I go and I review your um, record and look at your transcript. And then um, we get it approved if you have the appropriate background to opt out of 200A. One of the advantages of taking MSC 200A is it prepares you for the comprehensive exam. And so some departments have oral examinations. Um, we opted for a 20 question, multiple choice, short answer, um, test where if you score 60% or above, um, you pass. And as long as your GPA is a 3.0 and you pass the appropriate exam for the Fung Institute, you'd be able to graduate. Um, the exam will be offered twice each time during RRR week or reading, review, resuscitation week. And that's the week before finals. Um, in the fall semester, and again in the spring. Uh, I think we have 22 students this, this year. All of them took it. All of them passed it in the fall. Um, as long as you have a foundational knowledge in material science, generally passing it's not a problem, and we've never had somebody not pass it on their second try. <laughs> the capstone, um, this is kind of your research project. This is an old one that I ran with Eris Composites that we might revive this year. Um, 
you will get a list of capstone projects. You will find ones that are from MSD uh, faculty. But there's a host of capstone projects that are not offered by MSE faculty that you may be interested in. Well, um, much like we did with the um, courses and realizing that there's lots of materials, content spread throughout the College of Engineering, there's also lots of materials, content spread throughout the College of Engineering in capstones. And so if you want to take a capstone offered by, let's just say, Professor Tart Zodi, who's in mechanical engineering, um, you would send me an email with the description of the capstone and who the faculty advisor is. Um, odds are I probably know them and can get the approval right away. Otherwise, I will write to the professor running the capstone and I'll ask the professor if there's sufficient materials content, right? And so the idea of me checking the capstone is literally the first bullet point here. Is there sufficient materials content in the capstone for you to get a material science master's degree? <clears throat> and only once have I turned down a capstone request and that was because somebody wanted to do, um, it was essentially a software project on um, blockchain. And we could not find a way to extract any materials content from that. Um, so as long as there's materials content that in your final report, you can write reasonably about, um, it will be approved but you are getting a material science degree and therefore your capstone needs to have sufficient uh, materials content. And I know there's a question in the chat. Um, I'll come back to that. I'm almost done. I uh, So we'll come back and answer all the questions you have. Um, so Lee Fleming, who was the old director of the Masters of Engineering program, who oversaw the whole college effort, um, and I and others went through and we realized that a number of our students were taking additional courses. So instead of just the four technical courses, students were taking six, seven technical courses. And so we decide to come up with a way to reward, if not all of these extra efforts, at least some of these extra efforts. And so we came up with the Tech Plus certificate. Um, I ended up writing up two of them specifically um, in materials. So materials for bio and medical applications and materials for structural and nuclear applications. Um, and so these were kind of joint efforts with bioengineering and nuclear engineering, but you'll see a host of others and like certificate for IP and entrepreneurship strategy, Lee Fleming developed that. And if you are interested in IP and entrepreneurship, right, you could take the courses relevant to that um, certificate. And so the idea was to just allow students to gain that extra certificate for work that many were already doing. Um, and so that's really the end. Uh, welcome to Berkeley, hopefully. Um, and if you have any questions, please um, feel free to unmute or, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so. Oh, so. Um, so the question about when the email needs to be sent. So opting out, I'm assuming this was referring to opting out of 200A or the capstone or any of this. Generally, we handle all of that the first week or two of classes. Uh, if you get here earlier and you don't want to take 200A and you did your material science degree somewhere, right? You have a material science bachelor's. 
you can let me know and we can start the process before that. Um, but the process generally, I, I like worst case, it generally takes a day or two um, just because people might be on travel or whatnot and to get responses from emails. Um, and so then once it's approved, um, Ariana would make a notation in your um, folder, and then you would get an email confirmation that uh, this was fine. If you're so for capstones, um, you know you you'll pick the capstones. I think it's the it's during the first or second week of classes. Um, and so you'll get a complete list of capstones towards the end of summer. And um, if there are things outside the regular, what would be MSE led capstones, um, you can uh, send me an email at that point and I can take a look. And most of the people offering capstones have been offering them for a while. Um, they change the capstones, but I know who they are and I know generally what the capstones are and we can get that done pretty quickly also. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it could be done, you know, most likely actually before the interview process and before you meet with the capstone. So what most people do is they talk, they meet with the capstone teams, um, or the advisor. So like we will all have information sessions. And then from that, if you're still interested in the capstone, you know, you can drop me a quick email. I've got the list of capstones and I can go look at it. And if you just send me the um, description and the faculty advisor, because um, you'll hear the pitches from the capstone advisors then you will submit which capstones you want to apply for. And so generally by that time, um, I will have been able to tell you yes or no. So it's, it's a fairly quick process, mostly because I know the vast majority of people out offering capstones and what the capstones generally contain. So I know that they contain sufficient materials content. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so aerospace has so uh, aerospace has lots of uh, content there. Um, we've got the new aerospace department, well, new aerospace program that we should be uh, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, that we should be uh, having projects out of. So yeah, I think aerospace in general is not a problem. Um, where can we find previous cap capstone projects? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I know I have a list somewhere of old ones and I'm gonna talk to Professor Healy about some biomaterials ones. Um, I think you should be getting a list of current capstone projects shortly, Laura. I will look, um, let me see, old capstone. I, I will make a note. Right, I'll, um, like I know Peter Hoseman and I have for, oh, Ariana, you got, oh, thank you, Ariana. Yeah, there's some capstone um, profiles online if you guys want to look at those now. Um, but yeah, Fung Institute will share a list of the uh, prospective ones soon. And I'll probably be adding, th I don't know, three to five to that list. Um, I'm waiting for some companies to respond. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Any other questions? Hi, Matthew. Well, first, thank you and Ariana for for the presentation. 
it's quite helpful to hear from you guys. Uh, I was wondering, with re regarding the schedules, um, well, first, the concentrations, if I, please correct me if I understood it wrong. So, the we can choose the courses that are listed on the web page, right? On Berkeley Edward doesn't, it's not uh, all the courses that are listed in the in the M material science department web page, they're not necessarily going to be open, right? That's correct. I would go to classes.berkeley.edu. Um, and that, at least for the fall, um, they haven't posted spring 2024, but for the fall 2023, um, it is reasonably up to date. I think, I don't know, I, I, but yeah, so I, I would look at classes.berkeley.edu. Um, and then, you know, the classes I gave you and the classes, yes. Yeah, so the classes I outlined on that slide are a good guide to what's offered in the spring. Um, but I think, actually, yeah. So in the spring, Professor Yao will teach 218, which is the um, optical properties, because I'm going to teach a lower division MSE course for him so he can teach his grad course. Um, and then I know our newest professor, Professor Zhang, um, who is a um, additive manufacturing, 3D printing um, person is, or area of research and interest um, is going to be offering a grad course, I believe. So um, that is not posted as of yet. And I think that will also be offered in the spring. And regarding the same, is there usually is it usually hard to fit the schedules with the the business courses or no. Are there enough time slots also? There there's yeah, there's um for the business courses what they do is they offer multiple time slots. And so I, I have, we have not run into students not being able to take the technical courses they want because of business courses. And is it possible to take, for instance, like let's say you're really interested in three courses in the first period and just one in the second? Yep. Yep. You can do something like that. Yeah, I've had be, we've absolutely had people do that. That's not a problem at all, as long as um, the one caveat to that is you need to be a full time student each semester, so you need to have twelve units each semester. Um, but there are we can always work with you to make sure you have 12 units. Great, thanks. Yeah. Ah, so which building on campus? So uh, if it's an MSE grad course, they are almost exclusively taught in Hearst Mining Building. Um, and so I, I had this pictures of the student bay, right? The door I showed you went out to the lobby. Well, if you go out the back door of the student bay, we have two classrooms that the department controls, 348 and 350 Hearst Mining Building. And our classes are taught in there. And so um, it makes it very convenient. You can hang out in the student bay, do work and whatnot, and go to class and meet after class. Um, the classes for Fung are um, a short walk away from Hearst Mining Building. I, Mud Hall. Yeah, that's I forgot the name of it there for a second. Um, and so they're largely taught over at where the Fung Institute is housed.
I'll go, I'll go next, uh, Dr. Matt, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is Ibrahim. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you and um, Ariana as well for the informative presentation, to be honest. Uh, very helpful. And um, I'm really excited to uh, basically get enrolled in this program. Um, I just have a few questions from my end. Um, it's, first of all, I would like to start with the courses. Um, so I went through the website and I've seen like the list of courses. Um, and according to you, like we're going to basically see what are the courses uh, being offered for fall 2023. Uh, but I was wondering like if um, we can understand, for example, how the courses are being assessed, for example, for a midterm, final exam, coursework, and et cetera. So that's all on a course by course basis. Um, and so the first day of class, every faculty member will run through this um, for their class. So I'm not teaching MSC 215 this year, but when I taught MSC 215, um, it was a project based course. And so there were four projects throughout the semester and that made up your grade. But when I taught MSC 202, um, there was a midterm and there was finals and there was homework. So it depends on the individual instructor in the class. Most of our grad courses um, have midterms and finals, but not all. I see. Okay, uh, that's great. Thanks a lot for that. Um, also, uh, if we're going to basically uh, choose our courses that uh, we are aiming basically to get enrolled in for fall 2023, uh, is it possible, for example, to have a look uh, at it with you just to make sure that sure. we're in the yeah. back? Yeah, absolutely. Especially that yeah, especially that I'm, I'm really interested um, in the additional certificates that we may get, uh, particularly, for example, the uh, structural materials for nuclear applications. And I just want to make sure that uh, I'm, I'm in the right track and uh, I'll be able to basically graduate with the master's degree as well as the certificate. Oh, yeah, no, we can plan all that out. Um, and the certificates aren't, they're not too daunting to get. Right. I think they are fairly straightforward. And like I said, we had. So Lee Fleming and I argued about this continuously. Um, I kept saying that the Masters of Engineering student engineering program, while difficult, was not any more difficult than any of our other programs. And Lee and the staff kept arguing that it was. So Lee and the staff over at Fung finally went and did the numbers and realized that something like 68% of the students in the MEng program were taking additional technical courses. And so that's when we came up with this idea of this tech plus. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it is, it is very common for students to take extra courses. Um, and it's also not uncommon. I just had a student who's an MN student this year um, wanting to take lots of extra courses because there, once he got here, he realized there was lots to learn. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily think that's the best path forward to just fill your day up with um, nonstop classes. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it was more the norm than not the norm that students take extra technical courses. Yeah, actually, yeah, thanks a lot. This is a great opportunity for us and um, uh, truly thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity. Uh, one last question, I know I, I took a lot of time. Uh, it's regarding the uh, campus tour. So I understand that basically we will uh, be having like some campus tours uh, during the uh, uh, welcoming day or yes. etc. But I was wondering if we can have like one particular for the uh, material science and the engineering department basically to see um, uh, what are the facilities available for us. Yes, yeah, so... Um... 
I think during the, and I'm not sure how it's going to be set up this year, but generally during the welcome, the departments also participate. So myself and Ariana would participate and um, we might be able to, and they generally give us an hour and I meet with you, I think at Mud Hall was what we did last year. And so what we might be able to do is in that time, walk over to Hearst Mining Building and I can talk to you, answer questions, and we can give you a tour of Hearst Mining Building. Good. Uh, thank you so much. I'll be looking forward to meet you and Ariana very soon. Fantastic. All right. Any other questions? And I guess what I will do. So just in case you, you know, didn't write it down, um, I just dropped my email into the chat. Uh, and so feel free to reach out to me and um, if you have any questions and I'd be happy to answer them. Um, okay. You know, we try, we try and design the program to be as flexible as we can for you. And that's why we keep having faculty votes to um, essentially find ways to let you tailor the program as much as we possibly can while still faithfully calling it a material science degree. Um, and so I guess with that, I'll go ahead and stop. Um, if there are no other questions, I hope everybody has a great day or night, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs>